John Cola with OKRod.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. Today I'm doing another whiteboard episode where I'm sharing my thoughts about a raw foods diet and just a plant-based diet in general. To remind you guys, I got started in a raw foods diet like 99%, 100% since 1995. In more recent years I started introducing some small amounts of heat processed foods that have been heat processed in very select ways links down below to that you know as my journey as a raw foodist I went through different stages of being into raw foodism plant-based of course you know I went into a lot eating a lot of fruit and eating a more natural hygiene style diet I went into more you know nuts and seeds and and Wigmore style diet I did a lot of greens and green juicing and I mean I've juiced all the way along in my raw food career sometimes more than others you know, I've seen things and I've done things, you know, I've observed other people experiencing their raw food diet and the benefits it got to them. And this video is kind of like, in my opinion, next level. And you're not going to really hear this kind of content anywhere else. Because in my personal opinion, most channels, raw food channels, repeat the dogma. And, you know, that's why my, my channel, unfortunately, is not as popular as, as I would like it to be because I want to make you guys think in your head about things if some things are just making sense to you and logical. Maybe they do. Maybe you think this is full of BS and I'm wrong. Hey, great. I want you guys to think about something and not just hopefully go along with the status quo, you know, like I am not I'm against all fruit based diets. I am for eating a appropriate amount of healthy fruits and vegetables and in some cases other plant foods that are minimally processed whether you're processing them to keep them raw or not right and that's the fact of the matter is and in my personal opinion and based on what I've learned and experienced in raw foods I will say this I believe a raw foods diet is prejudiced towards certain nutrients because it is really selective towards certain nutrients that are components of a food and could care little or n not a lot or nothing at all about some of the other components of the food. When I got into raw foods, there was no such thing as gut microbiome tests. I encourage you guys to do a gut microbiome test to see where you're at. As well as I eat, as the diversity of foods and plant foods that I get, my microbiome test wasn't as I'll say good as I thought it would be. You know, if I'm raw vegan, everything's perfect, and I'm eating a lot better raw vegan diet, in my personal opinion. My grill my own food, go to local farms, source as much local and organic produce as possible, and then grow my own, and like eat all kinds of crazy things that most people never even consider on a raw foods diet. And my gut buddy diversity in my, you know, microbiome is not that good, and I know re I know why, and I'll be making future videos about that in the future. Um, you know, maybe there's some things that aren't exactly dialed in with the raw foods diet because the raw foods diet, when it was invented and created, the microbiome was not taken into consideration in virtually all the different raw food camps that are out there today. Now, by happenstance and by chance, some raw food diets may fare better or worse. Um, you know, as to microbiome testing, that being said, my data pool is very limited on how many microbiome tests I've seen from other raw foodists. But the fact of the matter is, depending on your specific raw foods diet will depend on your microbiome as well. There's other new and emerging research because I follow some of the scientific journal published studies. Um, I try to stay up with that and a lot of raw food people may just, all that stuff is hogwash or BS or have their own thoughts about it <laughs> you know I try to be rational okay I'm a raw food is first but hey let's look at the science and maybe I could make my raw foods diet even better and that's the kind of information I like to share with you guys and that's the kind of information you will hear in this lecture that you won't hear anywhere else so if you guys like my style lectures that I talk about and share my opinions on things based on some of the science I've read I'm not a researcher I'm not a doctor I'm none of these things so, you know, before you make any dietary changes, consult somebody licensed to do so. I'm just sharing with you guys what I do and my thoughts. 
and hopefully it might influence you just a little bit to hopefully, and my goal is to help you guys make your diet even healthier wherever you end up. But more importantly, get the information out there about raw foods that you know have come into my mind that I want to share with you guys because most people simply are not thinking about these things. So I have up on the whiteboard today um, why whole foods are good. And actually then I put, oh, whole plant foods. I'm not talking about animal-based products. And here's the thing. Each component of a food is beneficial. And there's many different components of a food in standard, like, um, nutrition. There's like seven components that are on this side of the board, including carbohydrates, fats and lipids, protein, amino acids, water, vitamins, minerals, and, uh, you know, that's the sixth, and then the, the seventh one that uh, it's like nutritionists will recognize now is fiber. And in these each categories, there's different kinds of carbohydrates, there's different kinds of fats, there's different kinds of protein, and different amino acids, there's, you know, structured water in foods, vitamins, different kinds of vitamins, different kinds of minerals, and, you know, and um, ratios of minerals, and as well as fiber, soluble, and in insoluble fiber. So those are all the given ones. Now, for me personally, there's a lot more components of a food than just what most people would think of. We'll go over those in a second. But before I do, I want to say, what component do you, you know, personally, right, or your diet prioritize? And that's a big question. Because what you prioritize, the component that's on the board, I believe, will affect and change your overall health outcome, right? Right? And it's like, do you, that you may favor certain components of food and think them to be more valuable, like if you're weighting them, um, or maybe your diet will just automatically weight more than others. Some diets, like a nutritarian diet, may weight some of the things that I would believe to be more helpful than not. You know, some diets, like, a, I don't know, carbohydrate-rich diet, 80-10-10 style diet, would maybe like, you know, think, prioritize carbs. You need to get 80% carbs. That's a lot of carbs, right? And maybe these other things, components of a diet, are not so important, right? Maybe some diets like a raw foods diet may prioritize things like enzymes that we're going to talk about, right? Because enzymes, you want to keep it alive. You can't cook your food. You're going to lose enzymes. You're also going to degrade proteins and yada, yada, yada. And so then maybe the proteins are also kind of emphasized as well, right? So, the question I have for you is, do, does your, of what you believe of these are the most important, match up with what your diet that you're following? And if you have an incongruence, I would encourage you guys to maybe get rid of your, you know, diet that is putting you in a box and broaden and don't just have like a raw foods diet. If, if you want to be in a raw foods diet, you're doing this, maybe break out of the box and create your own definition and your own diet. Nobody, every, you make up your own rules, man. <laughs> so aside from these standard seven components, six or seven components that are recognized in general, there's other components to food that I feel are so important and some other, you know, plant-based doctors, for example, also feel them to be important. Some of these are also unrecognized from plant-based doctors and even, you know, other scholars and whatnot. So yeah, let's go over these now. So I believe enzymes are critical to food, but maybe not in the way you'll think. We'll kind of go over each of these, you know, uh, components in a little bit. For me, the phytonutrients are some of the most important components of a food that, you know, many diet styles will not can take into consideration. Actually, most diet styles that I can think of, unless maybe you're on a nutritarian style diet, Dr. Joel Furman doesn't take the phytonutrients into consideration. And I even think Dr. Furman, I love Dr. Furman, could take it even further. Because <laughs> there's a whole many different phytonutrients, but I understand that most people out there aren't going to learn all the different phytonutrients. I don't even know all the phytonutrients, but I know a lot more than most people out there. And they, they each, each of them have different ranges of scientific published studies about them. Some more important than others, and some have more a lot more science behind them than, than others. But phytonutrients are amazing, and these are the nutrients or secondary plant metabolites that plants make to defend themselves from stress and, uh, you know, in nature and whatnot. So, I mean, we'll go over that in a little bit. Another uh, component of foods, in my opinion, that should be taken into consideration, and some diet styles do, but most do not, are the prebiotic components of a food that feed our microbiome. I believe this to be very important. 
if you get an ombre test where you test in your microbiome, right, they will give you food recommendations based on the bacteria that you're deficient in because if you eat certain foods that contain certain prebiotics, those prebiotics will encourage, you know, the, the beneficial microbes in your gut that you don't have. So I'm really a, more of a fan of the prebiotics these days than probiotics because I know I've taken a lot of probiotics in the past and my ombre microbiome test wasn't quite as robust as I would think it would be. All right, but that is a very com important component of food. We'll be talking about that in a little bit. And then we have probiotics in food. So yes, some raw food camps, you know, uh, deny, <laughs> yeah, deny, uh, deny things like fermented foods because it's rotten foods. You shouldn't eat them. But those foods have been cultured and are really rich in probiotics or the beneficial microbes living on the food that you can culture and increase. I mean, ferment like kombucha. I mean, if they're making homemade kombucha, I think that could be healthy if you ferment it long enough and get the sugars out. Don't fool yourselves. Most kombucha you guys buy in the store is basically sugar water, and in many cases it's pasteurized, and then they add back in, you know, shelf-stable probiotics to it so they could say they have probiotics. So it's, it's kind of scammy. So yeah, but probiotics, I believe, are very important. Also, there's just the indigenous probiotics that are living on the food as you're eating them. How does cabbage spontaneously ferment without you adding a starter culture? It's because the lactobacillus is living on the cabbage in the field. Of course, that could be reduced by chemical pesticides and things that will kill them. So, you know, it's always best to get organic and get local the grown produce that hasn't traveled far, refrigeration, and all these things can lower um, probiotics as well as other nutrients. Uh, next, we're going to talk about postbiotics. I mean, this is advanced topic stuff, guys. You aren't going to hear on any other channel. What are postbiotics? A lot of you guys might not even know. So, all right, so we know what prebiotics are. The prebiotics feed the probiotics, and the postbiotics are basically what the prebiotics make. So it's like you could think of it as the poop or whatever the probiotics put out as metabolites. So for example, if you ferment natto, you know, and use the bacillus subtilis, right, on soybeans, right, the bacillus subtilis will make vitamin K2, which is a postbiotic. You know, that's a very important example, especially for people that are vegan, because you may not be getting any K2 in your diets, although it is said we can maybe make K2. I don't want to rely on my internal K2 production from K1, if for some reason that isn't working properly, I want to make sure I have K2, it's especially important for bone health that many vegans may have challenges with, there's other reasons for bone health as well, besides K2, but K2 I believe is an important factor, um, so yeah, postbiotics, and then there's all these other undiscovered postbiotics, I mean, postbiotics in our microbiome could be like short chain fatty acids, which are essential for our gut health, for example. But yeah, some of those postbiotics could come along with your food or should be a factor in your food choices, in my opinion. Another factor that raw foodists would all agree with is the life force and or biophotons, prana, chi, energy, Karelian photography, whatever you want to call it. It's the, it's the energy force that the live food, you know, emanates before you heat it, process it, cook it or whatever else, right? It's also important to me, but you know, I mean, raw foodists may prioritize this as the most important thing. If you cook stuff, you lose all the life force, right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> now, another component of foods that's not often talked about, and maybe I'm crazy for including this one, but I want to include it anyways, is because when you eat a, a whole food, whole plant-based food, somebody grew it, right? Maybe it was grown organically, maybe it was grown conventionally, you know, but the problem is, foreign substances or contamination in your foods, right? If they're growing conventional agriculture and they're spraying it, maybe they're using Roundup, you know, or glyphosate as a ripening or drying agent on your food, you know, you are now taking in foreign substances in your food. Maybe you're buying conventional produce, right? Certain levels of chemical pesticide residues are allowed on conventional and even organic produce, um, you know, so you're taking in foreign substances or maybe like, you know, bird droppings dropped on anyways, there could be all kinds of different foreign substances on your food, you know, that you may want to consider when eating your food, because I know a lot of people just buy the food, wash it, eat it, and call it a day, right? But yeah, foreign substances 
can cause challenges over time if you're eating like oats and it's sprayed with glyphosate as a curing agent you're eating that every day that could negatively affect your microbiome according to some of the science out there and of course glyphosate also is linked to cancer and you know there's court cases where people are winning against Monsanto now now Bayer um, you know for that so yeah these are all the different components that I could come up with and there's probably more if I really thought about it hard but these are some of the most basic ones so my question to you is which ones do you favor? I mean, there's raw foodists out there that say carbohydrates are the best and they go so far that carbohydrates are so important we don't need anything else and they just take basically white sugar and add it to their smoothies because it's all about the carbs, man. Carb the F up, you know, whatever, all these, you know, all this stuff. And it's like they have no, like when you do white sugar, man, how many, how many phytonutrients are in white sugar or enzymes? I mean, even just water in white sugar for that matter. I mean, when you're making a smoothie, you're putting in water and stuff. You know, how many prebiotics are in white sugar? I mean, probably none, <laughs> you know? So it's just like, it's so crazy. So I wanna go over next, like each one of these and maybe talk a little bit about them and why they can be important, why you might wanna have more of these in your diet based on my study, my research and my experience. So carbohydrates, you know, carbohydrates, we're gonna get our calories from three different sources, carbohydrates, fats and lipids and proteins. When we're eating these foods that contain these, you know, major components uh, for caloric density, right, it's going to come with all these other nutrients, right, that, or all these other components. That being said, some foods will have a lot more of these other components than these main components. For example, sugar is high carbohydrates and pretty much deficient in everything else. Oil would be very fat, very high in fats and lipids, not have any carbohydrates and have very little of anything else, maybe some phytonutrients or something in olive oil. Not to say that, you know, oil is bad, but, you know, oil is not my first choice because I'd rather eat whole nuts that contain a lot more of these components. So I want you guys to eat a, <laughs> this is weird, a component-rich diet. Eat foods that have high levels of components, especially the components on this side is my preference. And of course, when you're eating fats and lipids, you know, um, there's different kinds of fats. You could eat omega-3, DHA, and EPA, you know, that you can't, unless you're eating like a fish oil or an algae oil, you're not going to get DHA and EPA. Maybe if you're eating enough omega-3s as related to your omega-6, you're going to make enough DHA, EPA. Once again, I don't want to rely on my body to be doing that properly. Um, so I take a DHA and EPA supplement. That's very important. Of course, we need protein and amino acids. And unfortunately... Even, you know, many people that eat a meat-based diet, oh yeah, I'm getting a lot of protein, and their main focus is protein, and if I go vegan, I'm going to be protein deficient. You're not going to be protein deficient in a vegan diet, on a well-planned, plant-based vegan diet. Even a raw foods diet, you won't be protein deficient if it's properly planned. You're not, you're not restricting the kinds of foods you're eating too much. Link down below on my video why I believe a raw foods diet can be restrictive. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're important. Especially as you get older, you maybe you need to increase your protein percentage according to some of the science out there. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's lots of good protein sources. Greens and algae, some of the best protein sources. Many people on a raw foods diet don't eat enough greens and leafy green vegetables or even algae. If you want to eat chlor chlorella, spirulina, even things like seaweeds, things on the bottom of the food chain. Um, water, water very important. Link down below to my video I recently did on the water content of foods and why it is so important. I mean, if you process your foods and like in the oven or in an air fryer, you're basically evaporating off the water, those foods will dehydrate you. Foods that are fresh and raw are full of structured water that are, it, that's really good for us. Vitamins, you know, these are things that are just commonly said in nutrition and we need certain levels of certain vitamins or we will become deficient. That's why you could buy a vitamin supplement. I do supplement uh, vitamin D as well as vitamin B12 this time. Um, but my goal is to get all my vitamins from my food. To do this, I eat a wide variety of foods, not just eating, you know, a small limited handful of different items week in and week out like I see some people do. Minerals, minerals are critical for our health. I mean, I'll probably have a whole nother video on the importance of minerals and getting a wide variety of minerals. And I think that's where a raw foods diet may fall short, especially uh, if you eat more fruits than vegetables. Vegetables tend to be more rich in a, a greater diversity of 
minerals than the fruits do. That's why I really rely on my vegetables. Plus, the other thing is the topsoils are degraded, and most farmers, even if they are organic or conventional, are not adding the amounts and the kinds of trace minerals in the soil so that you will have mineral rich food. Um, in addition, you know, if you don't eat things like Brazil nuts grown in a certain area of the world, you may not be getting enough selenium if you're not eating enough, you know, pumpkin, sunflower, and, you know, uh, Watermelon seeds, you may not get enough zinc and all these other different trace minerals that may be deficient in a raw vegan diet. So minerals are quite important. I mean, to get minerals, one of the things I do is I grow a garden and I enrich my garden with 70 to 90 different trace minerals, put it in the soil in nature's levels so my plants could absorb that, I could eat the plants, and hopefully I'm getting those minerals into me. If you're not able to grow your own and mineralize your own soil, then I would recommend eating seaweeds, which I also do, and switch up your seaweeds. Don't ever only eat dolls because you like it. You know, get some different kind of, you know, dolls, uh, sea spaghetti sometimes. I eat kelp. I eat this stuff called makabu. I eat wakame. I just eat different kinds. Eat some, like, I eat different kinds of seaweeds. Um, you know, so I'll get these trace minerals in me because they are important for different systems of our body. I know most diets don't even consider minerals. They're like, you just eat enough food, you'll get enough minerals. To me, like that's that's like not good enough. Like I want to do better. I've seen the importance of minerals. I'm not into mineral supplements. <laughs> maybe oh, the only mineral supplement may be like a fulvic or humic acid because those are basically composted plants from like a million years ago or something. Fiber is critical for our health. You know, when I got into raw foods, oh yeah, raw foodists, they eat enough fiber. As a raw foodist, you're eating more fiber than most Americans. That being said, depending on what you're eating, you may be getting only certain kinds of fiber and not others. So the main two categories of fiber, although there's many more, soluble and insoluble fiber, and I want to remind you guys, when you juice, you keep the soluble fiber because it dissolves in the water. Um... But they are both important, but if I had to choose one over the other, I would always say the soluble fiber is more important because that's what feeds our beneficial microbes in our gut. And the insoluble, yeah, that acts as a broom to help keep us clean and keep everything moving. <laughs> also very important. So, you know, I don't just drink juice for a living. <laughs> I might have like two to three quarts, up to four quarts a day of juice, but then I eat plenty of fruits and vegetables and you know enjoy them as well now these are just some of the common things let's go over to this side enzymes now enzymes are definitely important but they may not be important for the reason that you think it's often said that oh the reason why we need enzymes in our food is because it helps us digest our food all right so I give you that enzymes can help digest food you know that could happen maybe the medical literature won't say that happens I believe that happens but in my opinion, there's another very more important reason for having enzymes in the food because it makes the food more powerful. Well, enzymes are basically uh, little protein molecules that cause reactions. They are basically, they cause, they cause the plants to break down. So for example, if you take a broccoli leaf, you tear the broccoli leaf, as soon as you tear the leaf, there's damage to the leaf, enzymes are released, and there's a certain chemical process that happens in the leaf where the enzymes react to certain properties in the leaf to create, you know, isothiocyanates, which are basically powerful anti-cancer properties and anti-aging properties in the food. So, for example, if you just harvest a whole broccoli, you know, head or flower, you cook it immediately without pre-cutting it and then you eat it, you're going to have virtually, you're killing the enzymes in the heating process, you haven't released the uh, enzymes and they're already destroyed from the cooking process so now when you eat the broccoli you're not going to get the anti-cancer benefit right but instead if you just basically took that broccoli and started chewing it raw you would get the anti-cancer benefit because you're not killing the enzymes so enzymes are not necessarily there for us to help us digest our food although they do digest food on some level I believe they're there to basically in some cases make the food more nutritious for us in case of in the case of broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables such as bok choy, cauliflower, kale, collard greens, you know, Brussels sprouts, for example, you know, or even in the allium family or onions and garlic, which also some raw food camps just completely avoid because they're toxic or 
people into certain yogic practices, avoid those as well. But I believe they're also highly beneficial and they should not be heated because once again, there's an enzyme reaction in, that, in those that'll cause like, you know, make anti-cancer properties in the garlic and onions. And when you heat process these things, they go away. That being said, if you heat process and then you add enzymes back in, <laughs> then the reaction will still occur. That being said, I mean, enzymes, it's a totally crazy topic and you're gonna have to follow me on this one. So, I mean, there are scientific published studies that show, you know, hey, if you dehydrate something at a low temperature, you may keep the enzymes, but because you're blowing hot air, warm air across the food for a longer period of time, you may be keeping enzymes, but now you're destroying and losing the oxygen sensitive phytonutrients. How any way that you guys process a food, even if you're keeping it raw, you, I want you guys to understand that you are selecting for certain components. You're going to keep some of these components and get rid of others. So then you have to decide like, is the method I am processing my food, keeping the nutrients or the component of the food that I deem most viable? And that's a question I put out to you guys, and most people haven't looked at the science. So anyways, when you dehydrate food at a, at a slow rate, right, you may be keeping more enzymes, right? But the problem is now you're getting more enzymatic reaction because the enzymes are reacting against the food. They're going to cause the browning. When you cut open an apple, it turns brown. That's due to enzymatic reaction, right? Unless you heat that, then it, it stops it. In addition, if you use a hotter temperature to dehydrate your food, you're going to maybe kill some of those enzymes, but it's also going to stop the reaction. And also, so you're going to have more of the oxygen sensitive phytonutrients as well as vitamins in your food. So now you got to ask yourself, do you want to dehydrate at a hotter temperature to keep more phytonutrients and some, you know, sensitive vitamins that are sensitive to the oxygen degeneration, or do you want to keep enzymes? And in my opinion, if you are dehydrating food for enzymatically rich food, you're nutsy cuckoo. <laughs> nutsy cuckoo. Um, anyways, but I would say that for enzymes, man, you guys want to like eat some fermented foods or sprout some broccoli seeds or other kind of seeds, make, make some alfalfa sprouts, because those are super dominant in enzymes. Or minimally go out to a garden, pick the food fresh and eat it and start chewing it in your mouth and creating some crazy enzymatic reactions, right? That's what I'd say personally. But you see, you're not really going to hear this anywhere. It's just gonna, you got to keep it under 105 or 118 when you dehydrate. What's the pros and cons of that, right? There's pros and cons of everything, all right? So phytonutrients, I mean, to me, my goal and what I've learned over these many years, and I wish I learned this when I was younger, is that the phytonutrients, in my opinion, are some of the most important nutrients. Now, it's true. I'm not just going to eat only extracted phytonutrients because that's going to be not healthy to eat extracted lycopene tablets and all these things. But I'll sure as heck eat tomatoes to get lycopene, you know, and my goal is to eat phytonutrient rich foods. I think link down below to a video I recently made about talking about flavonoids and eating flavonoid rich foods, foods that have more phytonutrients than others. It's very important to me and just by making a different food selection when you go to the grocery store picking an apple instead of picking bananas as your dominant food or picking some white nectarines instead of bananas or better yet picking some berries to try to afford and eat as many berries as you can instead of bananas right I believe you will get more phytonutrients and I believe and based on the science you will get greater health benefits and eke out of your raw foods diet right where else are you gonna hear this kind of stuff like nobody tells you this stuff right Anyways, there's lots of phytonutrients, so I don't want to go off and rattle the list, but like lycopene in tomatoes, lutein and zeaxanthin in like things like kale, anthocyanins and my favorite ones, which are in like purple vegetables, purple carrots, blueberries, for example, apigenin in things like celery, farcarnol in things like carrots, you know, chalcones in things like ashitaba that I love to eat, isothiocyanates in all the brassica family of plants, including broccoli sprouts, very high, or even broccoli seeds, soak your broccoli seeds and just eat them, high in ithocyanates, allicin in the allium, garlic and onion family, leeks, and do not underestimate the mighty power of the shallot, nobody seems to eat shallots, but yeah, eat those little shallots, they're strong and mighty and high in antioxidants as well. So yeah, so like, these are just some of the phytonutrients that I can look them up and they got all these crazy names that I can't even pronounce, man. And the thing is this, every different food has different phytonutrients in it, right? And I would say that the green vegetables 
and other vegetables have more in general than fruits, especially weak, weaker color fruits. Uh, maybe wild fruits could be an exception, but most of the fruits you guys are eating are domesticated fruits that may be bred for sweetness, not for things like the phytonutrients in most cases. There's, they are exceptions to that. You also want to consider prebiotic foods, and this is some of my latest area of research that I've been looking up a lot of studies on and learning about myself. And I know it's said that, you know, hey, you want to eat a lot of things like uh, inulin-rich foods, like the Jerusalem artichokes, and like maybe bananas have the inulin in there and all these things. But, you know, we want to get into different kinds of prebiotics. So there's like prebiotics, when I talk about prebiotics, I talk about things in the food, components of the food that feed our microbiome that we cannot digest. I know some raw food camps will make up the saying, hey, if we can't digest it, we shouldn't be eating it. We can't digest starch, so you shouldn't eat it. You know, you should eat fruit instead of like, you know, potatoes or something because it has starch. We can't digest it. But what these people don't realize is our microbiome can digest it, will digest it, and they will flourish because of it. And if you don't eat certain prebiotic foods, you will be selecting for in your gut certain prebiotics to have in your gut. Now, the studies are, the studies are not out yet on what is good to have in your gut or than, than not. In general, the higher kinds of diversity of microbes in your gut is going to be healthier. And as well, there are certain kinds and specific ratios of beneficial microbes you want to have in your gut and you know I believe eating a more well-rounded diet is going to be helpful so for example when I ran my gut microbiome data through a third-party website it said I really didn't have the gut buddies to digest starch <laughs> and I'm like why would that be well because like for basically all of my raw foods career I never ate starch like 25 plus years I have not been eating any starch <laughs> My microbiome proves it! I haven't cheated on stupid potatoes! Because <laughs> I don't have those gut buddies to do that. So now I need to slowly incorporate some, and I don't do white potatoes, I do purple potatoes, only steamed in the Instant Pot. Once again, link down below to that video. So now I could, you know, eat some of those starches, as well as also have purple sweet potatoes, very high resistant starch as well. I'll have, probably have another video on resistant starch coming up soon. That could be another maybe deficient component of a raw foods diet, because most people in a raw foods diet don't consider that, and most people in a raw foods diet would never even eat green bananas, which does have some resistant starch, but there's different kinds of resistant starch, different topic. So yeah, so I'm introducing some of those to get those bacteria in me, because once again, I want to have a wider diversity of bacteria and be better balanced. Um, in addition to resistant starch as prebiotics, another very important subject and topic area are the oleosaccharides. So there's things like FOS, GOS, TGOS, and even HMO that we're really not going to get into, but those are just abbreviations like fru fru frugo oleosaccharides, like you know. So and those are like in inulin-based products like Jerusalem artichokes and you know, even artichoke hearts and whatnot, and yacon, you know, asparagus, things like that, bananas to some lesser extent. But you know, if you're eating a high fruit-based diet, you're not eating any kind of tubers you're really going to not get a lot of FOS unless you're really cranking up your banana consumption. On the GOS, I mean the GOS is in things like beans and some root vegetables. So if you're, once again, if you're eating a high fruit diet, you're not eating any roots because, you know, roots are not good, they're starchy or something. You're not going to have any GOS either. HMO is like human milk oleosaccharides and that's advanced topic. And, you know, unless you're drinking some breast milk, you're probably not going to be able to get them vegan if you want to maintain fully vegan, like legit. <laughs> and I'll probably have another video on that once I've, you know, experimented and have more data on that. So yeah, these are also very important prebiotics to feed our microbiome so you have a more robust microbiome. To remind you guys, I got into raw foods because of an autoimmune challenge. I almost lost my life when I was younger and that caused me to find raw foods, believing that it's the number one way to have health, which in many ways it is but I found some holes and I want to patch up those holes so that I don't get any invaders in me and have a strong gut microbiome by adjusting my raw foods diet. In addition, the probiotics are very important. You know, all along pretty much, there's been times in my raw foods career where I shunned fermented foods based on some of the teachings that I learned. But for the most part, I've always included small amounts of fermented foods, which I think to be a good thing and I probably want to increase my fermented foods based on some recent scientific 
published studies that say fermented foods may, I don't know, modulate your microbiome better than just eating, you know, prebiotic foods or high fiber foods for that matter. And once again, there's different kinds of probiotics as well, so many different kinds. And then postbiotics, I mean, I make videos about natto, vitamin K2, and how many other raw food is talk about that. Um, postbiotics are very important, especially the postbiotics that occur in your gut as they make them. Uh, short chain fatty acids that I'm still learning about myself, but it's important to have the right gut bacteria to make the short chain fatty acids um, in your gut. And based on my microbiome testing, you know, I was not where I want to be to make, you know, high levels of these, some of the short chain fatty acids. Of course, life force and bio photons, very important to me. I mean, I feel the difference when I literally pick a leaf out of my garden, or pick a cherry tomato out of my garden, put it in my mouth and chew it. I mean, there is life force energy in there. People may think I'm crazy for saying this, but there's life force. It can be measured. I mean, advanced places like Germany measure bio photons with meters and all these crazy things. But I believe that's quite important. But is it important to sacrifice other food components so that you can eat a more phyto bio photon or life force rich food? You know, once again, I think life is more about a balance. And hey, it's, as much as it's great to eat sprouts that are super vibrant in bio photons and life force and super important to eat fresh foods, hey, sometimes I will heat process my food because I want to select for eating a different component. So I don't have to get all the components in one specific meal. I could eat all the components in different meals, right? Of course, foreign substances, the last component, you know, I talked about a bit earlier. We want to watch about the foreign substances on our food. You know, whether that's dirt because you didn't wash your produce well, whether that's bad bacteria, bird poop that could get you E. coli damage. You know, whether that's pesticide residues that can come along with your food that are invisible to the eye or even worse, systemic pesticides that have been absorbed into the fruit or vegetable. You know, I mean, the only way to prevent this is to literally grow it yourself. I know exactly what was sprayed on everything in my backyard garden. And it wasn't by me. It's probably by the planes overhead. So I'd still do wash things. I mean, and there's planes flying overhead everywhere and cars on the roads and a lot of the fields are just next to roads and there could be, you know, different contamination, you know, heavy metals on the food that you should maybe wash off. And we're not really gonna get into that, but a lot of diet styles just have no particular attention to that. I mean, even some raw foodists, like, oh, it's all right to eat conventional, they eat 100% conventional based diet that in my opinion would have more foreign substances than locally grown organic. You know, that being said, I'm not a big fan of industrial grown organic foods, but if that's your best option, that's your best option. And I would choose industrial grown organic foods in most cases over conventional foods with the exception of things that are on the clean 15. And I would definitely encourage you guys to look at the clean 15 and dirty dozen um, by the EWG environmental working group. So you can see the produce contamination, at least with pesticides. All right, so you guys just learned about all the different components of foods and some of them and some of the ways that I eat to select for certain components, but now I wanna kinda of go and dive a little bit deeper. So you guys just heard about all the different components of foods, my take on them, what I strive to do, and some of the components that are more important to me than others. And now I wanna get into some common ways that raw foodists process their food and how that will reduce or eliminate some of these components, right? So for example, right? Dehydration is good, right? Because you're dehydrating food. But then if I put something in the pressure cooker, it's bad because it's above 115. So now I'm a bad person. I should go to the raw food jail because I heat process my food in the instant pot below 248 degrees. It's still not causing some of the mass carcinogens. I do not recommend any cooking method that heats your produce or foods over 248 degrees. So the pressure cooker or boiling or steaming would be the only heat processing methods I would recommend on rare occasion I wouldn't say like do it all the time but I you know I do it I eat a small amounts of heat processed foods daily these days once again small amounts um, but when you dehydrate things as I talked about earlier you basically may be keeping the enzymes but it is at the cost of oxygen sensitive phytonutrients and minerals of course you're also removing the majority of the water from the foods and also dehydration can affect some of the different components as well, and I haven't done all the studies, it definitely will affect the life force and bio photons for sure. 
So yeah, so don't think dehydration is just, I'm free and clear because I could do that. You know, you are damaging the food on some levels. Maybe it's still alright because you're keeping enzymes, but you know, once again, there's a pro and a con. Now when I steam something or do a pressure cooking in the instant pot, what happens? Well, yes, I lose the enzymes. But when I lose the enzymes, right, then what happens, and I'm breaking open fibrous cell walls because of the steaming process, right, the phytonutrients can actually increase. I know you've heard a lot of raw foodists say that when you heat process food, you could never get more than what the food has to begin with. You're always gonna have less than. And man, guys, I've tried to rationalize this as like 20 years as a raw foodist to say, they're right, science is wrong. But as I look up the science and look more, all I gotta tell you guys is some of the science says that some of the phytonutrients after heat processing in select ways can actually be higher than raw because there's like probably two reasons. One reason is once you kill the enzyme activity, the enzymes can't act and break down the phytonutrients more and lower them. <laughs> so in raw foods, especially if it's been sitting a while, the nutrients may degrade, but when you heat process them, you kill the enzymes, so then they won't degrade anymore, and then also you're blowing open cell walls to make them more bioavailable. Now juicing can also blow open cell walls and make nutrients more bioavailable without the heating. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of juicing as well. Um, when you heat process, you're also keeping high levels of water content, maybe even a higher water content than the food had to begin with. So, for example, cooking beans that are dry, and then you, you cook them in the Instant Pot, they're totally moist afterwards, because otherwise they're still hard and chewy. You know, you're still keeping all the fiber and everything. But yeah, you're gonna lose enzymes, but you're gaining water content and phytonutrients. So for me, that's a, that's a, for me personally, I'd rather steam things than dehydrate things at this point. That being said, just because I can steam things, just that doesn't automatically mean I'm gonna steam stuff, right? Hey, if steaming some food or putting it in an Instant Pot and cooking it at a lower temperature with water, allows you to crank up your greens consumption or vegetable consumption and you would not eat them otherwise, right? That's, that's the thing, would not eat them otherwise. I have a lot of bolting kales and things that are just not quite as tender as I like to eat. You know, I may put them in the instant, I mean, maybe I juice them first would be my goal. If I don't juice them and they're getting kind of too ratty or whatever, you know, I may heat process them. Oh, let's talk about this, oxalates, right? So this is a very particular interesting topic, right? If you eat, the spinach or Swiss chard, for example, raw, you're gonna eat oxalates. If you juice it, you may even enhance the amount of oxalates because now you're breaking them down and putting them into the juice and they're soluble and insoluble oxalates, right? But if you cook spinach or Swiss chard like in water, like you, you know, steam them, for example, or boil them, the liquid is gonna, then the oxalates are gonna come out in the water, then you pour off the water, you don't eat them. So now you are reducing the oxalate load in the spinach. Of course, you're losing the enzymes, losing the life force <laughs> in there as well, but you're gonna lose the oxalates. That being said, I encourage you guys to eat an oxalate appropriate diet. Don't eat too many and don't eat too few, because once again, there's published science that show oxalates can feed certain gut buddies or beneficial bacteria in our diet and make, make you know, the postbiotics for us. And if you're not eating oxalates, then you're not gonna have the the gut buddies that digest them and then make the postbiotics. And also, I mean, the nutrients in the food, our body has learned over thousands of years to deal with them if eaten in appropriate amounts. You know, to me, an inappropriate amount of spinach is juicing it every single day. I always eat a spinach salad and I always use spinach. Dude, you grew up in nature, like I have a garden. Like my garden, like it won't grow spinach in the summer. It's way too hot, man. I eat, I've been eating wild spinach. I got lamb's quarters in my garden right now, so I eat that, that's oxalate rich food. But I eat spinach like when it's in season, which is like the winter time. So like late winter into spring, eat tons of spinach. Right now I have Swiss chard. I've never been a big fan of Swiss chard, so I eat it here and there, and I, I'm probably gonna do a heat processing batch. Otherwise, I usually juice it or I heat process it and actually give a bunch to my parents so they can eat it. I don't know, I just don't like these things. But once again, link down below to my video on plant toxins and how they can be beneficial for you. Once again, if you process them appropriately and not eat too many of them. I think it's sad that people get on their you know, juice recipe and they make it every day and it has like a ton of spinach in there. They're really increasing their oxalate load needlessly when they, I believe they'd be better served by you know, rotating their diet and having spinach in the juice one day, Napa cabbage in the next day, having some romaine in the next day, maybe some dandelion the next day, and like switching off your greens. 
So you never build up too much of any one food that may have nutrients, which is good. And you're going to get a lot of those nutrients, but you're going to miss out on the nutrients and phytonutrients from other foods. All right, so another widely accepted method for processing your food in a raw foods diet is the blender. Everybody owns a Vitamix, it seems like. Maybe some people have a blend tech. And you just put the food in the Vitamix, and then you just blend it up. Turn it on, blend it up, it blups up to the top, messes up the top, so you gotta rinse the top off, I hate that. Glugs up. And then you're blending it up, and you see that vortex, it's like mixing everything up, so it's like grinding up your kale, and grinding up your bananas, and all this kind of stuff. Now what most people don't realize is that when you see that funnel cone in the middle, Right, you could just put straight water in there, turn your blender on, you could see it, because the water is clear, you could see it. It basically looks like a little tornado. So that tornado is basically a lot of air. You're basically sucking an air vortex cone into the food as the food is being blown open with the blades. Air is being bombarded in the food. So when you are traditionally blending, right, you may be keeping the fiber, because fiber is important. You're keeping all of it. But the challenge is... Oxygen sensitive vitamins and phytonutrients are being oxidized. You are losing them. And I don't even know what it does to the life force energy after it's been put in the blender and all chopped up. <laughs> or the enzymes. But I do know the phytonutrients and the air sensitive vitamins will, can be lowered by up to three times. According to scientific published journal studies, right? But that's all right, but juicing is bad. Slow juicing is bad because you remove some of the fiber. Once again, when I choose a juice, right, I am selecting for certain nutrients. When I juice, I remove the insoluble fiber. I keep the soluble fiber. I keep the life force. <laughs> I keep the prebiotics in there. I enhance the phytonutrient absorption because I am blowing open cell walls so that they're more bioavailable for me. I mean, this is shown in a scientific study that if you drink carrot juice, you're going to have higher levels of beta carotene in your blood than eating the food raw alone. So once again, I'm selecting for certain nutrients. So blend it, juicing is bad because you're, you're losing the fiber. Blending is good because you're keeping all the fiber. Yeah, but that, the, cost, the cost is you're losing oxygen-sensitive vitamins and phytonutrients. And once again, I prioritize in my diet phytonutrients. Now, of course, I get enough calories because I eat enough food. But I really try to choose phytonutrient rich foods, you know. So, how do we solve this blending issue? Well, you know, that's why I'm a big fan of making videos on vacuum blenders. Nobody else has more videos on vacuum blenders than me. I'm the crazy raw food dude that wants to maximize my phytonutrients. I've done all the research, I've seen the data, and more importantly, I've experienced it. I've tasted vacuum blended smoothies. And, you know, the published science shows you could retain up to three times more of certain air-sensitive polyphenols and other phytonutrients than traditional blending. Because now, when, before you blend in an oxygen-rich environment, you're sucking out all the excess oxygen. And then you blend, so now you're not going to have the oxidative damage. In addition, your smoothies will taste stronger. And maybe to most people, that's going to be a benefit. So you could use less of some of those expensive ingredients. To one person I had, she's like, I don't like when I vacuum blend <laughs> because it tastes too strong. I'm like, all right, return it. Like, that's really rare. And you know, you're also going to have less separation. You're going to have a better texture and mouthfeel, better color for your Instagram pictures. I mean, it saves longer. So if you like make a banana smoothie and you drink all of it and you made too much and it sits in the blender craft for a couple, four hours and you don't drink it and you're, oh, I forgot about my sweet. You drink it, you're like, oh, this tastes horrible. It's because they've been oxidizing because you're literally mixing in oxygen and you're putting dissolved oxygen into your smoothie, right? I have a dissolved oxygen te tester I'm going to be testing and busting out really soon to show this, right? So then you, you don't have dissolved oxygen, so then your all your smoothies store longer for better with less oxidation. Once again, preserving more phytonutrients and the air-sensitive vitamins for you guys. If it's important to you, maybe it's not important, you just want to blend stuff up. And yes, you are still doing way better than people that are eating soda, but why not give yourself every possible advantage? Those of you guys that have gone through a situation like me where they, you, I was in the hospital and they tell you, hey, you might not make it out alive, right? I want every ace up my sleeve, right? To like, you know, make sure that I'm gonna have the highest level of health and do all these little things. You may think I'm crazy, but hey, I got into raw foods not for extreme athletic performance, not to run marathons, but because I almost lost my life. And this has been the trajectory of my diet, my lifestyle, and what I've learned, you know, basically is that 
all the different components of foods are important and I want you guys to match up the components that you feel are important and see if they line up with your specific diet style you know and if, and if they do not compute if they don't add up like right then you need to modify you need to change your diet style maybe get a different label if you want to still keep a label make your own label but you know do what you feel is important right if I had to say which ones of these are important to me at my life at this stage in time when I'm filming this I'm gonna say I mean all these are more important right but to me, the phytonutrients are the most important at this stage of my life. Also, I'm really interested particularly in some of the prebiotic fibers because these are things that I really haven't even focused on in my raw foods career. I'm just like, oh, just eat fruits and vegetables. You're going to get enough uh, prebiotics. But based on my testing, my microbiome testing, like that wasn't happening, right? Of course, you want to get proper amounts of fats and carbohydrates and proteins, structured water, super critical vitamins and minerals so you don't go deficient different kinds of fiber and these are just the main classifications of fiber but there's all kinds of fiber and every different plant food will create different kinds of fiber so eat a diversity of foods when's the last time you guys had cactus pads or aloe vera there's different kind of polysaccharides in there and fibers that are kind of slimy and jelly and most people don't even like those textures enzymes important especially researched in allium family and brassica family and i hope that there'll be more research on enzymes and other foods and how uh, other foods, enzymes that are already in the food can make the food more nutritious besides just breaking the food down. So, you know, enzymes have like a dark evil side where they break food down, although that could also help us digest our food. Um, yeah, prebiotics, yeah, so and then life force, super also important. I mean, of course, I don't want foreign substances or chemicals or contamination on the foods that I eat either. So yeah, that's basically what I want to throw out there for you guys today. I want you guys to consider some of the components of food. You know, in my opinion, people that are more advanced will show you the light of the different components of food and show you guys what they feel is most important to benefit your health the most. I mean, I mean, I think it's an old analogy to say that the carbohydrates are the most important thing because clearly it is important and critical you get enough carbohydrates or fats or proteins as a source of your calories into different ratios, but let's not forget about the phytonutrients as well as the prebiotic effects of the foods as well. I mean, the life force also is super important to me. I mean, when I eat things out of my garden, I just feel much more alive than, you know, eating some heat processed food that I try to minimize. But, you know, that's what it is. And hopefully this video has shed some light or at least planted a few seeds that may grow and develop in your mind for later. And you could figure out what of the components of a food is more important to you and you want to focus on and no matter what you guys are doing I'm going to tell you guys this as my final you know thing I want you guys to broaden the components that you eat you know if you're eating a carbohydrate rich you know diet you're not eating any overt fats you know <laughs> they're also important you got to make sure you get up omega threes maybe you want to sub in with DHA EPA you know as well so you don't want to have cognitive decline when you get older you want everything working properly right it's just and then people just want what's the answer John just tell me should I eat a fruit diet and go on a juice fast and just take herbs to cleanse like like I personally wouldn't do that I mean people could get results on any diet and here's the thing a lot of diets will work and the reason why they work is because the diet that the person moves to on is way better than what they were doing but what if they even took it to the next level and did even more and a better well-rounded diet where they definitely accounted for the certain components of the food that some diets just basically don't take into consideration. So if you guys enjoyed this episode, hey, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. That'll help out the YouTube algorithm, get this video out to more people. Also encourage me to make more videos on off-the-wall topics that I like to put out on my Raw Foods channel as I have been doing this for 27 years and think a little bit differently than most people they just go along with the dogma because I'm like every day almost I'm looking up some kind of something on you know PubMed or scholar.google.com and researching different topics to kind of fill my brain with more knowledge and uh, be able to make my health better and also share some of these tidbits with you guys as well so hopefully I'm making a small difference in the world also please be sure to share this with somebody else you guys could think it could help once again it's for maybe more advanced thinkers people that are easy thinkers that just want to know what to do <laughs> this is not the video for them because this video in my opinion is going to make you think about things a bit further and hopefully dial you along to maybe hopefully eat 
and focus on a few other components of the foods that you may not be currently focusing on. Also be sure to click on the subscribe button right down below if you love this content and want more content like this because I'm always come up, uh, coming up with new content to educate you guys about the power of eating more fruits and vegetables. Make sure you click the little bell to get notified as many new to come out. And if you are a current subscriber, make sure the bell is still clicked because I've heard some, pe some people are getting unchecked bells from YouTube for some reason. And finally, be sure to check my past episodes. My past episodes are a wealth of knowledge, over 600 episodes at this time, teach you guys all about eating a fruit and vegetable based diet for your health. Links down below to some of the videos I've referenced, including my video on water, as well as flavonoid content that I believe to be super critical for a healthy diet as well. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.